for everyone. Uh, good evening. Call this. Uh, what is the date today? It's uh, November seventh. November seventh. <laughs> uh, wow, November. Um, meeting of the DRB uh, to order. Um, I'm Rob Goodwin, the chair. Introduce the members starting on my right here. Don't forget to pull the microphone. Kevin O'Connell, board member. Meredith Crandall, staff. Catherine Burgess, board member. Abby White, board member. On our Zoom platform, we have Michael Lazorczyk. Yeah, Michael Lazorczyk. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Joe, are you here? Joe Kiernan, president. Can you just name that? Uh, no, it's it should be on speaker view. Let me check the middle. It should be popping well, up. The he's showing up as Stephanie. No. Sorry. I'm going to get right in your space. Um, view, speaker view. Maybe I need to exit full screen. That'll help. We asked Joe to talk again. Hey, Joe, can you uh, just do a sound check again? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, now can you hear me? Yeah. I see my little microphone going green. Yeah, you're good now. All right. Thanks, Joe. It was also just making sure that our settings were right here so you pop up on the big screen when you talk. Great. Okay, do we have a uh, approval of a agenda for this evening? We can do that first. Move to approve the agenda for this evening. Second. Motion by Sharon, second by Kevin. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 We have an agenda. Um, so Maris can take a couple minutes to review the remote meeting procedures and uh, to yeah. take it away. Do my thing. We do have a lot of people on remotely this evening. All right. So for everybody on remotely, I'm going to be sharing my screen here. Um, most of the stuff on the screen is for those who might be watching this meeting remotely over Orca Media, over the streaming, so that they'll know how to access the meeting tonight. But there will be some um, points that I'm making that you'll want to keep track of as well. So for anyone viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's Development Review Board meeting by either typing this link into your browser, um, and that will bring you right into the meeting so that you can see what's going on and participate. You can ask questions. We'll be able to tell when you raise your hand. Um, your other option is to call this phone number here. And when prompted, plug in this meeting ID. Um, you won't have a share screen ability because you won't be on your computer, but you can still participate in the meeting, hear everything that's being said over the phone, um, and let us know when you have questions or comments. If someone is trying to access the meeting and you're having problems, please email me here at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout tonight's meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. Um, we do ask that you keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This reduces background noise and potential conflicts. Um, I don't have anybody on logged in via phone yet. If somebody who's on watching via... Um, Orca Media decides to call in, you can use star six on your phone to mute or unmute. Um, we do ask that you reserve the Zoom chat function for troubleshooting or logistics questions. Any substantive questions or comments, we ask that you raise your hand. And when called upon, you can um, provide those questions or comments at that point. Um, we have several, uh, a few of us in here monitoring the full um, Zoom platform so that we will be able to see when you have hands raised. We do also have several people here um, in person in council chambers. Um, I will let the chair talk about that, about how we're gonna manage that that dual, dual set of comments. Um, and when you're on via Zoom, you have the option if your camera is on, Feel free to raise your hand physically. There is also a raise hand button um, that you should feel free to use. And we'll keep our eyes open for both of those. Um, uh, I think you know once the chair has recognized someone to participate, um, please make sure to provide your full name and address. We don't have an official record for tonight because it's not an official hearing, but it's still helpful to have that information. 
um, and will help for the um, minute taker. Um, in the event the public is unable to access this meeting, um, and I'll find out about that via email, um, we'll probably need to continue it to a time and place certain. It's sketch plan, so it's a little, little more fuzzy, but we like to make sure that everybody who wants to participate in a public meeting can. All right, I am now going to hand this meeting back over to the chair. All right, thank you, Meredith. So we have uh, some minutes to approve for um, October 17th. Uh, anyone have any comments or revisions? I make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Second. Motion by Kevin, second by Sharon. All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, well, you, Jeff. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so much fun. Are you not raising hands for these motions? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just a few comments this evening. Uh want to reiterate re re a comfort reiterate a couple of things that uh Meredith said. Um, one is a sketch plan. Um, it's not on the record. We're not swearing anybody in. There's no real big decisions that the board is making tonight other than providing guidance to the applicant of our review of the application thus far and uh, hearing thoughts from those in the community that have also reviewed the ap application to, with hopes of improving the application and the process and uh, whatnot. So um, just keep that in mind. We do have some folks on the Zoom platform and some folks in the room. We're gonna do our best to manage that. Um, we'll probably be taking you know comments and recognizing folks in the room chunk of them and then going to the platform to uh, try and keep things a little bit more organized. Um, once again, uh, use the raised hand function. If you can't figure it out, like chat somebody or email Meredith uh, or whatnot. Uh, at some point in the meeting, we'll check in for all these requests and uh, make sure that uh, everyone that has attempted to you know, provide comments this evening was able to. Um, so with that being said, move on to our um, major order of business. Um, and Eric, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Eric Stauffer, and I'm uh, along with uh, Sean Folks, my partner, the owner of 12 North College Street. Feel free to move the microphone closer to you if you need to. I don't know how long the cord yep, will stretch. That's plenty. Yeah. Can you hear me? Well, uh, it'd be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Eric, you want to give just like the brief, like 30 second summary sure. of this, and then uh, we'll give it over to Meredith uh, to sort of like go for the staff report summary, and then we can give it back to you to sort of go more in depth on some of the you know issues you'd like to everyone to hear about. Sure. So uh, 12 North College Street is a 0.72 acre property um, up in the Town Street neighborhood. Um, it's the uh, barn that was built, I believe, in 1887. Uh, it was the original Murray Barn that kind of goes, that gave Murray Hill neighborhood its name. Um, it was turned in 19, in the mid 1970s into a single family residence. It was jacked up, put on a new foundation. Part of the interior was insulated. Um, they lived there through the mid nineties. It changed hands at that point and kind of went on a downhill trend from there. Uh, and over the last couple of years, uh, has been left abandoned. Um, there's a lot of pipes that broke inside, et cetera. Uh, and we bought it out of foreclosure this summer. Um, since then we've been cleaning up the interior, um, meeting the neighbors, both informally and formally, um, and starting to make plans for kind of what we want to do with it for the future. Um, we are proposing to make it a multifamily dwelling, um, and have applied, um, for a sketch plan review for that. And we are utilizing what's the infill PUD section of the zoning code to do so, or zoning regulations to do so. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Meredith, you want to give a little summary of the key points in the staff report? And yeah. So what I'm going to do is do just a quick little reiteration of the procedural status here first. Um, this is sketch plan review, and that's something that applies under our current regulations only to subdivisions and planned unit developments. So they're both subject to the same procedural standards. They have very different um, substantive standards. So there's a lot of things that are considered when you're doing a subdivision that if you're doing a planned unit development like proposed here that doesn't involve actually dividing the land up, you don't need to, to worry about. Um, and both of these go through both a sketch plan and a final review. Right now we're in the sketch plan or some you know a preliminary review where this is all about making sure that the applicant 
has the information they need to put together a more complex, more detailed final application that will be the application that actually has a decision about whether or not a permit can be granted. Um, for this particular um, sketch plan application, the staff report has a lot of items in it in red. A lot of those are notes to help guide the applicant in pieces of information that they wanna make sure they have when they come to final application. Um, there are, however, a couple of points where the development review board, uh, um, I feel should really be giving the applicant, giving IRIC some guidance um, so that in the final application, he knows what standard he's actually trying to meet. The main one of those has to do with the infill PUD density bonus. So that analysis in the staff report starts on page four. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we really need the board to confirm that how that density bonus is calculated is assured, right? Because if, if the calculation there's off, then instead of getting five units, it would be four units or three units. And that, that makes a big difference in how you're planning for this proposal. Um, the other item that I flagged in here where it would be helpful if the board gave some guidance is on the parking and locations for parking um, for this project, given the, 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 the requirement that parking be behind the front line of a dwelling doesn't really mesh with allowing parking inside any residential driveway but in this instance, we're also having a situation where parking is being sort of, there's parking, clear parking spaces off to the side of the driveway. So giving, giving a little guidance there on what you would like to see in the final application would be helpful. Um, and the staff report on that um, section starts on page nine. Um, I do have, let's see, if there are people in the audience who have not seen the staff report that was included in the agenda, I'm gonna put a copy up on the table because I have one extra. And I can hand this back to Eric. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, Sharon. I just wanted to make sure that this was the title that I thought it was, Meredith, on page six of 13. It says uh, 800 square feet. I presume that's 8,000. It's uh. Yeah, that okay. was supposed to be an okay. extra zero. All right. That's where there's a comma. All right. All right, there is a perfect. title. I am I, not perfect. Did you, get, did you get a copy of the staff report? I do have it right in front you of you. All right. You. So um, you've had a chance to look at it. Um, yeah. So we'll let you kind of go through and uh, give a little presentation of what. what Sorry. I do just as, because I know we all know, but it's just a reminder that if you want me to read the emails yeah. into the record that we got after the packets went out. Forgot about that. Okay. I think um, everybody here got them, but just in case. Yeah. I mean, I think that these are kind of in the category of like, you know, public comments. It's not okay. um, like additional information from the applicant. If, it, if that were so, I'd go first, but yep. kind of like, just, yeah. Just flagging yeah. it as something Thank later. You. When yep. people want it, I'm happy to read any of that in if needed. All right. Well, please ask questions as I go and guidance and let me yep. know what specifically what you are, are looking for. Most people behind me and, and online. Um, so as I said, we are putting in a proposal. We've applied for a for five dwelling units um, in this property. All the dwelling units will be in the current footprint of the existing um, barn that is there. So we're not adding any square footage to the barn, um, nor are we talking about building any new structures there at this time. Um, in order to uh, the zoning, it's in a residential 9,000, res 9,000 zoning area. Uh, we have about 30, I don't know, numbers right in front of me, I'm sure it's here, 31,000 and change square feet uh, on a point, 0.72 acres, uh, 31,363 square foot lot. <clears throat> the reason we applied for the infill PUD was to be able to put more units in there to create more housing for the city, as we know that, as we all know that is a need, that is one of our goals in the project, and to make it financially viable to create housing. Right. Um, so those two things, one doesn't happen without the other. Um, in the infill PUD, um, there are density bonuses, as you well know. You can get uh, by meeting, I think there's six or seven um, possible uh, uh, categories. If you meet 
two of them, you can get a 25% density bonus. If you can meet three of them, you get a 50% density bonus. Um, and so we are looking at uh, meeting three of those requirements, and those requirements are on the additional units that you receive. So if we um, normally you would be able to have, if it was straight zoning or a straight application without the infill PUD, um, it would be for three units would fit on that size lot. Um, so in, in seeking the other two, we are looking for to meet three of those three of those requirements, 50% density bonus. The way we calculate that density bonus is based on um, the lot area um, and then applying the 50% to the lot area, um, bringing us to just over just over five, 5.22 units. So that's where the number comes from. So just, there's a there's a confusing part of that, or maybe not confusing, because I was confused the first time I read this section of the regulations and I saw a uh, you know affordable house, essentially affordable housing infill PUD. You can go the affordable housing route. And I was like, oh, so like you have affordable housing PUD, it's like five units, uh, you know, affordable housing. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. Like you get the existing few units that were allowed, and then it's it is very much the essence of the word bonus. <laughs> yeah. Two extra units are the ones that have to meet that you know criteria. Um, and so, I'm sure, someone else out there, uh, maybe the first for the first time, read it the same way. Uh, and um, I think the board in another sketch plan, we did have that um, discussion, or it wasn't a sketch plan; it was just you know something on the record and kind of established that. So I didn't know if board members also saw it that way or wanted to discuss that. It's one of our decisions this evening. I am mean, definitely interested in knowing which three categories you think you're going to hit. Mm -hmm. That seems like an I haven't narrowed, I have not narrowed it down to three, but I've narrowed it down to four. <laughs> part part of it, so if nobody's done, you know, this is the first time someone's in, in my understanding, it's the yeah. first time somebody's done an infill PUD under right. this set of zoning regulations. Some of the stuff when I asked initial questions of um, the city of Meredith, trying to find out what some of these things mean, what is a definition, a workable definition of affordable housing, um, what is a HERS rating score and how does one go about getting it? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so trying to find out what some of these definitions were. So um, that I have it in front of me, I'll define that section so that I don't mess it up. We are looking at the ones that I know that we're looking at are the, for once again, for the two units, the two bonus units would be um, 1200 square feet or under. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at the HERS rating score, depending on what that means. We are looking at the private or semi-private outdoor space um, for each of those two bonus, bonus units. And there's another one in there too. Fourth one. If anybody has that page quicker than I, I do, would it be know. accessible or visible? Uh, it, it would be accessible or visible. Yeah. So the two that we're not really looking at are affordable or um, senior housing. So I'm sorry. I'm, uh, so the setting private outside space, the less than 1200. Yep. And the HERS rating. The HERS rating and visible or accessible. Oh, visible or accessible. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and the the hers rating I think is something we're going to have to work with the building inspector, um, and the, it, it's not something that's in here. So you and I are both going to yeah. have to do some research on what that means in the efficiency, you know, energy efficiency right. world right now. Um, and this was written in 2018, so some of the definitions that are in the definition section of these regulations sometimes no longer correspond with what they were originally based on. So we'll need to, we'll work on that. Okay. Yeah. And just for anyone that does HERS rating score of 50, is it the, is a test of energy usage in the building or, or in some sense or another. And uh, it's mostly based on a model is my understanding from the people that I've talked to. I'm sorry, based on what? A model more so than like a coming out to site, but I'm not okay. positive about that. Okay. Um, I just while we're while we're yeah, on the topic, please. I just want to make sure that one of the big things we want to sort of give guy clear guidance on is that um, density bonus calculation. We just whether report from board members if what they think that you know what was presented is is reasonable or we need any more information uh, at the final application or a thumbs up or a thumbs down would be helpful. What's the Total square footage for the dwell for the dwelling itself for the building proper for, for the, the barn it's forty two by sixty. Um, so three, it's about three, a, three floors of forty two by sixty. 
Yeah, it depends how you want to divvy it up. It's two main floors. The basement is walk out on two sides plus glass on another. Um, and then so you you could squeeze close to 10,000 square feet if you were really trying to use every square inch of it mm -hmm. if, with the with attic, you know, finished attic style space. I guess just, just feedback on how the um, density calculation was done in the back report here that the uh, first method, which is what the applicant used as well, um, seemed to be clearer to me and it yeah. felt more intuitive. <laughs> like, agree. okay, this makes sense. Um, I, I like that better than the second option. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Nope. That's the, the second is my going all the way down to the base. Yeah. I, and like, Meh. <laughs> they both come up with the same thing at right. the end. <laughs> my head started spinning when we doubled the size of the lot. <laughs> yeah, I was like fifty percent increase in the lot. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that made sense to me as well. That the per, to use the first calculation, yes, the one that the applicant yes. used. Yeah, no, same here. I also thought that. Um, all right. Um, we don't mean to mess up your uh, no. I mean here, I don't really have a flow, so that's great. So I think uh, parking parking was the next major issue that yeah kind of touch on and. Uh, so currently, um, what we're proposing is five units in there. Um, parking requirements are one parking place per unit with no more than two parking places per unit. So we're looking at between five and 10 parking spaces. If I understand, I think what we have currently proposed is eight or nine. And um, as you uh, approach the building from North College Street or approach the lot from North College Street, um, as you pull up, the building is ahead on your right. And there's currently a large parking area that already exists from the past uses at the building. So on the um, west side of the building, um, kind of as an extension or a widening of the driveway out there. To the uh, left of the building. To the left of the building. Okay. Yeah, thanks. As you, as Wait, you guys from the left from north, or west, I was like, Meh. sorry, as you're coming from North College to be okay. on your left of the building. Yeah. Um, and our proposal is to just improve that lot. So with taking what's already there, there's already gravel over most of it, expanding it um, and making it, uh, you know, more friendly. Um, we're proposing a gravel drive, um, gravel parking, um, and all the parking that's currently proposed is uh, is along that side. Um, as you're looking at the parking, the hillside starts to rise up um, further to the west. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that helpful. Um, so there's the parking just to the left of the hand there. There's a swale, uh, a drainage swale, and a hillside that's uh, that's off to the left, which is kind of that blank area, correct? Um, so that's the the parking as we currently have it. And so the previous uses of the property that utilized that parking, what, what was that? Or My assumption, well, I think when that single family home there, my assumption yeah. was that they used it. Um, I'm not sure officially what it was designated at by the city uh, in more recent years, but I think there was a number of cars that were up, yeah. up in that area. Sure. Um, so whether it was single family or multifamily or boarding house or what it was listed as. Um, yeah, it, it's, it was always listed as single family okay. because we don't get into rentals or number of um like roommate type situation yeah, right. that doesn't come up unless it's something that hits a specific trigger under the building code um and so my understanding is this was a situation where it was a single family home but there were multiple lessees or tenants in different rooms yeah. um so there were there were a variety of vehicles there yeah. and that's one reason that We've got this bigger. So yeah, that's area. that general parking area that you see there. So we're talking about improving it to the left on the screen, which is also west. And then that dark line that you see there um, is the swale. Um, and so we would be staying entirely to the, as we're looking at that picture, entirely to the right or east of that swale. There may be minor swale improvements, but we're not talking about moving it. We're not cutting into the hillside on the other side of it in any way, shape, or form. All the parking would be basically, um, you know, a small expansion of the lot that you're looking at right there. Um, I believe the building, the front of the building or the, the road facing would be the south side of the building. And so Meredith brought up the idea that um, right now, if you take, go back to this, to my sketch there, the yeah, computer you drawing, it smaller. Oh, yeah. Give me a right now I do extend, I do show those um, parking places extending beyond the front line of that building. So those last two and a quarter spaces or whatever the number is right there. Uh, so that'd be something to what makes an official parking place versus a widened driveway, um, I think is something you brought up. Uh, and then there's also the possibility of creating two spots where the diagonal fence uh, is shown there in the uh, upper corner of the building of turning that into an L-shaped fence 
um, running more in line with the front of the building. Yeah, exactly. Um, to create the possibility of a couple more parking and possibly accessible parking spaces there, depending on uh, code requirements for visibility, uh, visitability or accessibility. So, so we do have a specific parking requirement for the PUD. Um, I think it's specific to PUD, but it says no parking shall be required in front yards except within an approved driveway. So we would have to determine yeah. for this where the front yard is, which it's, it's defined in the regulations. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's the. So yard front means the yard that is located between the street and the nearest line of the principal building on the parcel and extends across the full width of the parcel. So it's kind of a dead end public streets. Yep. No, it no, it's, I mean, yeah, but this is the front and the, the street um, right of way actually curves yeah. at the end and jots over to the side. I mean, this is, this is the front. This is the street. Because you have to I mean you have to have a front yard for all of your setbacks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I just think on the, the being the right away ending like that at the property line is something that the survey would probably have to figure out. Just want to make sure that there's that public right away doesn't somehow just like go all the way through the center. No, nope, it's right here. I mean the one before here. This is a survey. Yeah. Your surveyors should figure it out and should turn on the flat, like you know, that the end of the public street because it's your boundary. I mean, like yeah. that's part of the that's part of the process. So, like, yeah, I mean, Meredith's got a sketch here of like something that's you know that's that's maybe it may or may not be you know the case. Um, that's a, that's an official survey of the property. It's just a it's just a segment of it. It's yeah. a so as you can see the whole thing, because um, he won't have to actually resurvey because he's not dividing the property lines. We won't have a final plat for this. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a planned unit development without dividing up the property itself, right? So it's subject to the same procedural requirements of sketch and final, yeah. but there is no subdivision of the land. So there won't be a final plat. You don't have to go through chapter 350. It's just chapter 340. Interesting. All right. Perfect. <laughs> chapter 340, and when we get to the final, <laughs> he'll also have to go through um, site plan. Perfect. Scratch Keep that. <laughs> Keep going. Um, I think the other, the those are the two major things that you guys were looking for some uh, to to discuss at, at the board level. Things I really want to say is like this is a prime opportunity to create housing in Montpelier. Everybody has been talking about it for a long time. Um, we're excited to have the opportunity to be a part of something like that. We're talking about the ability to create five new housing units without having to build any new structures. We're reutilizing re a historic structure that's already there. We're not talking about um, larger footprint. We're not talking about developing new land. Uh, and so we just think it's a prime opportunity uh, to do so. So we're happy to be part of that. And I just wanna make sure that I mentioned that. This isn't part of um, the regulations, but I was just interested in um, what size do you imagine them to be? I imagine them all to be in the ballpark of 1200 square feet. Plus or minus, there might be some small variation between them, but that's the the target size that we're looking at. I have a, I have a question. Are you suggesting any um, grading or, or changes to the the driveway itself or the swale? Not in any real. No, no major changes to grading. Um, of the area, we're not planning on cutting away any banks. We're not talking about a lot of fill. If we end up putting two of the parking places on that north side of the building with an L-shaped fence, there'll be a small amount of fill that will have to go in there to level that out enough, but um, nothing major. No, I can't imagine that a uh, retaining wall will be necessary or anything along those lines. As far as the swale is concerned, it's mildly overgrown right now. So I think if we're going through the trouble to improve that parking lot and make it a nice place um, for someone who's going to live there, we'd probably improve that by scraping it out, but we're not talking about moving it or anything in, in that sense. So no major grade grading that. Um, yeah, so it sounds like just disturbance of the land will be very minimal. It'll be very minimal, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. The other board members have questions? 
I have more questions, but if you want to keep going too, that's fine. I don't have a whole lot more that I'm okay. looking to present. Um, would I'm you just talk a little bit questions. about what you're doing in terms of screening and neighborhood and yeah. where things, which ways are, which is a little, uh, I haven't been up there, so I don't, didn't yeah. exactly know what it looks like from the rest of the neighborhood. Yeah, sure. Or can you see it from Main Street? You can see the, the uh, part of the roof and building from Main Street. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, not a ton. Okay. Um, but you can see it from Main Street. It's behind um, what used to be the old Murray farmhouse. Mm -hmm. So as you're looking from, as you're driving north on Main, as soon as you pass Town Hill Road on your right, if you start to look to your left, um, you can see it through the, right. the kind behind of that porch on it kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. That farmhouse. Um, and then you're uh, talking about putting a fence in the back to. One of the, <clears throat> um, to, in that, uh, the picture that was up before, um, get that back up. Yeah, we're talking about a privacy fence back there for lights um, and for um, just to provide some definition at that back corner of the building uh, near the neighbors. Um, I can also pull up a um, Google Maps view if you give me just a second. So you can see where the neighbors' houses are. Uh, So there's the barn, right? And so there's neighbors' houses up in here. So he's you're talking about a yep. fence up right in there. here to help, you know, as cars are coming in here and trying to park or any sort of entrance light here that'll help cause create a shield for these near buildings. And just out of curiosity, where are the next neighbors as you come down that street? Huh. The street, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Those, I, right, yeah. Eric? Correct. Those are the two closest? Yeah the, yeah, the last two houses on North yeah. College. About how far away are those? Do you know? I can't see. Um, scale. Uh, Couple, like 200 feet, yeah, maybe? Two to, 150 okay. to 200 feet between here and here? Because the Something scale's like right here of 100 feet. So in addition to the fence, is there additional screening or, or landscaping that you're so. thinking There's, about? I have been thinking about it. I don't have a formal a landscaping plan or a proposal of screening at this point. Um, part of it, I do want to talk to the city because that, that little um, indent of land, the turnaround or right away. That's yeah, there right the away. There's actually several trees that are on there. I know that the city, um, when we had our technical review, TRC, technical review committee um, meeting, there was some concern. I guess they used to push the snow all the way up into this property. Mm -hmm. And so now they're going to have to find out where to city's going to have to find out where to push their snow. And so some concern about whether or not they're planning on taking down some of the trees that are in that area. And that would influence my um, mm -hmm. landscaping plan. Um, yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I've taken the opportunity to meet many of the neighbors uh, and I also intended, uh, attended uh, an informal meeting requested by their city council person um, as to express some of their concerns about the project. Uh, and some of that was in screening. I'm, uh, I want to make sure to try and be as good of a neighbor as I can be um, in this process. And so I'm open very much to developing landscaping and screening plans to help uh, within reason as much as we can um, mm -hmm. privacy issues. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's a requirement in the site plan standards that will apply for the final application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had related question. I'm realizing you're not quite at the design stage yet. Yeah. Could you talk us through a little bit what you're thinking about for sure. the common open space and also just help us understand the orientation? Like, would all of the units be coming in and that it's all going from the parking to a sure. single entrance into the building or would there be multiple entrances? I think, you know, that can make a difference with the circulation and the parking location. Yeah, sure. So the current plan is to have... Uh, with five units, we would have four entrances on that west side, where the, uh, right where the hand is, yep, along there, each unit having their own individual entrance to the building. Uh, a fifth unit would be accessed through that walking path and entrance, and that'd be the lower level. Um, the bank is cut away, I think with a barn, and so that would be going into the, um, what is the basement in turn, but walk out on two sides and, and glass on a third. So that's the, where those, where the access would be. Yeah. And as far as design, we haven't gotten in uh, in too much detail yet, but the plan is kind of currently, the current plan without uh, any commitment to it is to divide the building into quadrants, basically. Um, and so that each each unit would be uh, townhouse style, upstairs, downstairs, so no one would be living above you unless you're in the basement unit. And each person would then have light on two sides, so you'd occupy a, a corner of the building. Yeah. 
Okay. That makes sense. Any open space? In open space, not inside the building. There'll be no common yeah. areas inside the building, right. but then open space that will be shared by the, the uh, folks that will be living there will be on the south side. So the front yard, uh, well, that's the, so the front yard of the building there is a very flat open area. Um, actually a really pleasant spot. And then the hillside um, where Meredith had the hand a moment ago uh, on the west side, that is all um, currently open and is, uh, will be the other open shared community space. And are you considering any storage on site? I'm considering storage on site. So in uh, once again, in the basement, there's more than enough uh, walkout access to the basement that even with a 1200 square foot unit uh, on the east side, on the picture right as it was up on the screen, there would still be enough space to allow everybody to have access and storage um, in, in the bulk of it too, for tires, canoes, bikes, Bike. stuff, all that. Yeah, so there'd be ample, ample room for that, which I'm excited about. That hits most of the key issues. We can circle back to some stuff, but um, at this point, I think uh, makes sense to open it up to some public comment here. Um, we'll start with the uh, um, there's some folks in the room. Um, see that we do have one uh, written comment here, and uh, Jack McCullough, I think you forwarded this on. Um, would you like to just maybe summarize what um, Kim Cheney had said? Oh, uh, oh, that wasn't just Kim. That was like uh, that was. Jack, summary of the meeting. The community meeting. Yep. Yes, got it. Sure, sorry. Uh, good evening, I'm Jack McCullough. I'm uh, the District 2 City Council member, although uh, I'm not, uh, and I also live in the neighborhood. I'm, uh, as the crow flies, I'm probably the farthest property from uh, from this property down at the end of Town Street. And uh, <clears throat> when uh, talks started going around the neighborhood about this proposed development, the, um, I organized a meeting of uh, of residents and Mr. Stauffer on the site, and and we had a good turnout. We we didn't take uh, attendance, but I would say that the majority of the uh, lots, uh, majority of the properties in the neighborhood were represented by at least one of the uh, one of the owners. And uh, and my purpose was to and you and you have the email which I would ask to be. Uh, included in the record uh, is just a summary of, or my recollection of all, all the observations, the concerns that uh, members of the neighborhood raised. Um, make, I make no attempt to claim that, you know, how many people uh, support each one of the concerns. Uh, I, I don't really know, but uh, I, I just wanted to, <clears throat> provide as much information to the uh, to the board as possible about uh, what feelings uh, members of the neighborhood were uh, were raising. And so I, I think that there are people here in the room who probably want to speak to specific points that uh, that are in the memo, but uh, okay. that's it. Thank and, you. and I should be clear, you know, being in the neighborhood, I uh, could could be said to have a personal uh, interest in the development. I'm not here to take any position or make any rec recommendation about uh, what you do tonight. And certainly the city council has not taken and would not, <laughs> I would not expect the, the council to be taking, a, taking any position on the proposed development. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so we also have an email from Dana McCarthy, um, which brings some comments. Um, which to make sure that that gets entered. She, yep, and she's on remotely as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Hi. Yeah, my I think you've answered my concerns, but um, one had to do with the snow plowing um, because I do know that it's a dead end and they've got to put that snow somewhere. Um, they aren't going to drag it back down. So that I was curious about because otherwise it impacts the two closest residents. Um, Auburn and Fran and, you know, are there entrance egress in and out? Will that be clogged now because the snow will be piled up there? Um, the other thing was storage that hadn't been mentioned when we all got together. So I was just curious as to what would happen if people have boats or even, uh, you know, like a pull behind trailer of some kind, is that going to take up the parking space? But just, just curious about how those things are going to be handled. That, those were my concerns. 
Thank you, Dana. Um, I guess that concludes our uh, written comments here. Um, anyone else in the room would like to come up to the microphone and issue any comments? <laughs> oh yeah, you don't have yeah, you don't have to have anything written. It's just whatever you want to present at the microphone. And sorry, I don't know if we can make that go any taller. <laughs> if you want to just tell us you hard, make sure if you signed in um when you came yeah. in the door and uh yeah. Hi. Um I'm Chris Killian. Um and uh my wife Stephanie Hurley, who's on the on the uh video and I own the original Murray family farmhouse, which uh, abuts the property just to the north and our address is 280 Main Street. Um, has been a three unit, our house has been a three unit, so I understand multi-unit use in our neighborhood it is now a two unit. We're Well, we haven't had our final uh, uh, certificate of occupancy walkthrough, but we converted the farmhouse back into what it was historically for our family. And then we have one unit in the back. Um, but not surprisingly, as part of the original farmstead, this building, which is an amazing building uh, in many, many ways, looms large <laughs> in our experience of our property. Um, and um, we're trying to figure out what we think about this whole thing. I'm not here to, you know, uh, take any positions, but we do have some concerns that we've talked with Eric about and, and that are, we hope, relevant to the, to the committee. Um, I guess first I would say just in terms of intensity of use, um, what is being proposed is a dramatic change. Uh, for the neighborhood and for, for us. The barn's been there for well over 100 years. Um, it's a big building. It's been that size ever since. It has been a single, we've, we've owned uh, our property for 12 years, I think. And um, during that time, it's been a single family uh, home, the barn. Um, it has had, um, it had, a separate apartment in the basement. So I don't know how that figures in, in terms of what the city considered it to be, but it, there were two dwelling units there uh, throughout most of the time that that uh, we've owned, owned the property. Um, and that's the time during which, as Eric referred to it, the, the use has been very spotty and strange. And I don't want to dwell on that too much because uh, you know, it, it was what it was. And before that, you know, a lot of folks talked about the folks that lived there and who turned it into a single family home back in 1977. And apparently it was a well-maintained uh, single family home, perhaps with an apartment. Um, <clears throat> never, I think before, has there been this intensity of use proposed, residential use for that building. I mean, we did some historical work looking at the farm and what it was and have found some really interesting stuff in our house as we've done the renovation. And I'm sure there were a number of cows in there at one point. Um, also way back in the day that the property was used as a um, sort of a livery for hauling granite and shale from different quarries around. So there were you know, uses there, but there haven't, there hasn't been this intensity of, of residential use and uh, attendant traffic and, and, uh, and just uh, presence of, of people. Um, and I think that's important in the context of the regs, including the PUD reg, because everything in the zoning regs cues back to the character of the neighborhood and the definition of the neighborhood. And so these questions of intensity of use and, and infill have to be considered, including under the PUD. It's the third specified purpose in the PUD reg that um, the character of the neighborhood has to be maintained uh, to the greatest degree. I can't, I could read the language. Right. Meredith knows it better than I do. Um, so there, there's that, um, but how that really, um, plays out for us is um, traffic uh, and 
we have uh, very, uh, our, our experience has been um, periodically, there wasn't a lot of traffic intensity there in terms of parked vehicles during the time that we've lived there. There was a period when there were a lot of cars coming and going, which seemed to be more associated with drug related activity at the house that we went through a whole process with Jack and the police department with. Um, but we haven't had the experience of lots and lots of cars parked there or co coming in and out. Lots and lots is maybe an exaggeration of what might be proposed with five units. But um, we just want to make sure that uh, there's appropriate screening and design and there's um, uh, 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 you know consideration. Irek was just referring to um, sort of the width of the building being maybe a bit of a defining factor. We would rather have parking formalized out of our view. We look directly across our yard. There's now discussion of potentially adding additional parking spaces by doing uh, grading there on that Northern portion. That would all be in our direct view. Granted, there's a fence proposed. This is a concern for us. We just don't want cars pulling in and wheeling in with lights coming from behind uh, fencing um, if it's not adequately screened and, and appropriately managed. And I, I think there probably is a way to do that, but we had thought perhaps um, starting the parking uh, sort of behind the building and, and extending down toward toward uh, the end of Town Street more, as opposed to having it pushed up to that north side into our art space and into the view shed of, uh, of the back of our house. Um, and then the other, the other piece is, um, um, I, you know, I brought some pictures. During the entire time that we have lived there, uh, there was a fair amount of vegetation screening the building, including some mature trees on the east end of the building. I think I uh, identified them as potentially compromising the foundation and they were they were all cut back. Um, and so we went from a building that at least three seasons of the year was pretty well screened, even though it's enormous and very tall, to basically just a wide open building with uh, virtually no screening uh, remaining. And I understand the rationale behind taking the trees down, but our experience of it is that we went from having even the tall gable end of the building being blocked by a tall um, box elder tree that is not the best tree in the world, but basically blocked the end of the building uh, fairly effectively. Even in the winter, it broke up the visual sense of the building to basically just looking directly off our porch at this very large structure. Um, and so we're concerned about screening around the building generally on our side. And I think that that's hopefully a mutual interest because I think it's going to be a heck of a lot more, more marketable to people if they're not just watching us all day long, every day of the year and what we're doing. Um, and the, the other thing I would note along those lines, and it's just a change and we're trying to grapple with what it means, is window placement on the north and east ends. Those areas of the building have throughout our entire experience, and um, I think that means in terms of looking at the building structure itself, probably through most of the building's history, been cold space without many windows. There are only a couple of windows on the north side. And they were associated with a garage that was rarely used and was mostly storage. And if that is all now two to three story living space, we're gonna have lots and lots and lots and lots of windows looking out on the east and north side. Again, if there's a way to screen and provide some visual breakup, that could be a solution, uh, even with this intensity of use. But it is a concern to us that if we're looking at, um, you know, 12 or 14 or however many windows um, and they're looking at us, you know, lights at night and people forgetting to turn lights off or keeping lights on. And then just like the privacy component is, uh, is a bit of a concern uh, for us. So I know we're at the very beginning of the process um, and I can contact Meredith or, or someone else to understand a little bit better about how the process fits together. Um, but, you know, based on my read of the zoning, 
um, more than a certain number of uses and uh, uh, units in this neighborhood as a conditional use and would require a conditional use review, even though it's a PUD. Now the PUD supersedes. Yes. So where, do, where do the that, regs actually say that? Because yep, I, so that's section 3403E, use standards. And the first sentence is any residential uses shall be permitted within the infill housing development, whether or not they are even allowed within the applicable district. And I put an even there myself. So permitted is a term of art. So it's permitted versus conditional. So all the residential uses, if you qualify under this infill PUD, all residential uses are considered permitted uses, not conditional uses. So, so the conditional this, use review doesn't apply to this application. So permitted doesn't mean issuance of a permit. It means right. authorized by the regulation. It means that, it, right. So if 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 this were a situation where, um, I'm trying to figure out how to, it, it means, so if you look in the use table, um, there are permitted uses, and there are conditional uses, and then there's a dash, which means a use isn't allowed at all. Right, and in our so district, permitted... it's by number of units, and right. by number of units, if you're over three, anything over three is marked with a C. Right, but okay. this use standard clause here overrides that and converts all those Cs, and if it's a residential use, even a dash to a P. Okay. So it's a permitted use. So conditional use standards no longer apply. Um, so you don't bring in the um, heightened scrutiny of character of the area that's in conditional use. You don't bring in the heightened scrutiny for traffic that's in conditional use. Those don't come in. And that's a decision that the Planning Commission and the City Council made in adopting this infill PUD um, because it applies only to certain residential districts and because it applies only to parcels of two acres or less it therefore by by that alone it has limited the number of units that are being allowed right and then to get those extra units you have to meet these special criteria of either affordable or accessible types of housing that the planning commission and the city council decided they really wanted to see more of in these particular neighborhoods where this type of PUD is allowed. Um, so they've already, that's that's the balancing act that they have made when they drafted this. Um, and that's all reflected in in uh, some form of regulatory history? Um, if, if you wanted to go back to that from 2016, 17, and eight, you know, up until it was adopted in, in January, 2018. So, I mean, yes. Just, just to take a big step back, I mean, the PUD is a, is a widely used zoning, you know, form. Um, I'm, you know, well, across... I'm well aware of it. Right, sure. Energies. And so, you know, I think that, you know, this is, you think of it, the regs, it's like a track, it's like you choose a PUD and it's like stringent. There's a whole another set of regs. It's almost like we're going through a zoning process for this specific parcel, as if the planning commission makes decisions for the entire city we're going through and we're rewriting the rules for this specific parcel in exchange for, you know, certain, uh, things that have been determined by the regulations to benefit the public. So I know just for everyone else, like that's sort of the large concept here. And yeah, so I just want to, in that context, at least go back to the um, opening paragraph of the PUD uh, provision, which clearly refers to the character of the neighborhood and, and sets that as a core purpose. And, um, you know, I've I, I know that there's an interpretation and I just want to underscore that from my perspective. Yep. Um, that should be taken into consideration at this stage. And it's it, it shouldn't be interpreted that this regulation that clearly refers to that trumps all aspects of other aspects of the zoning. So I, I, I just put that com comment out there and um, we want to work with IREC. We want to figure this out. I'm. I, I feel that uh, you know there should be a way through. Um, I'm not sure that looking at uh, you know more than uh, 14 or so windows directly over our property on a building of this scale and the change in the in the character of the neighborhood that that would bring. 
uh, without some sort of screening plan really cuts it from our perspective. So, so just a note. So thank you. The staff report today is just looking at the PUD standards. The site plan standards, which include landscaping and screening, right, come into play when we hit final application. It's just one of those things that you can't even measure right here without a much more detailed plan. So that has, well, there are very detailed. This is perfect. Know, I'm just letting you know that that. we can work something out, then, then you know, maybe I, I won't show up anymore. Yeah. But, um, don't you just let you know that, that that the whole landscaping piece does come into yeah, play? Yeah, the landscaping oh, I, and screening I, does yeah. come into play. I'm just yeah. I'm just making sure you are well, aware I, of that. I, I That's understand all. the interpretation okay. of the PUD, and I'd be very interested in that history because at least from where I sit and the work that I do in my daily life, I'm not absolutely convinced that this doesn't require like a conditional use permit. So okay. that's just my view. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Krolik. I live at 6 North College Street. And um, if you haven't been to North College, you know, many people don't even know our three little streets exist up there. They go, where is North College? Where is Town Street? Where is Sunset? You should take a drive up there. And what you're going to see on North College is you're going to see a short dead end street with five houses. There are children, there are animals. What you'll also notice going to North College is to get onto Town Street. It's a very precarious turn. It's at the, um, it's directly um, opposite um, <coughs> Town Hill Road. <laughs> and so it's a sharp turn, it's a steep hill. That's why many people don't know about this area. Um, I think this development of, of five units, which potentially could bring many cars, it would, it potentially could double the current neighborhood use of that street, as well as increasing traffic problems. So I see not only changing the character of our neighborhood, but also safety issues. Um, we have even on Town Street, there's even a problem with speeding and by doubling the character of residents in that neighborhood, I think um, is not the, not the neighborhood that I bought into. It's not as though I'm against development in some way. I guess I personally feel five would be excessive it seems to me that in this current market, since we're not going for the affordability units, that even three units could um, would be enough um, revenue to to cover the development cost. Um, is there anything else I want to say? Yes, I'm concerned about um, lights, traffic, safety. I'm concerned about um, the, it's wedged up very close to Aub Auburn's yes. home. Um, I think it's like 50 feet, really. It's, it's not far. Um, so I would just, you know, to have a really informed decision as we go through this process is to have a drive up there and, and you can really get a sense of, of what all of us are talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Anyone else? Yeah. So I live next door. Oh, just make sure it's a microphone. My name's Fran Kuski. I live at 8 North College, so I'm right next door. Um, when the property at 12 was occupied, there were never more than maybe two or three vehicles parked in the lot. There's never been on a regular basis, eight or nine. So there was usually one car that wasn't working. So it never left the property. There is a garage in in that space. Isn't there a garage door? There's a garage door, yeah. Yeah, yeah correct. So I don't, I don't think that was ever used, in, at least recently. I've been in the neighborhood 10 years. And I purchased my home in a residential neighborhood. Um, 
and it's clear to me that this will be a change that we'll have lights and we'll have traffic. We will, we have six cars on the street right now. So it'll be double that or more, probably more. So um, it is upsetting to think that it will change to that extent and that we will have so much traffic going by. I don't know where people will park who visit the property. They'll probably park in front of my house. Um, I don't know where the snow will go. It used to get pushed into that property. It's also pushed in front of my mailbox. And I can't imagine that, that it's not gonna be pushed in front of my property somewhere. So it's it will be a change. And the city took out a lot of the trees and now more of the trees have been taken out. So we have more view of the barn and with the windows, we're gonna have more light coming from the property without any barrier. Right now, we have no, and there's no plans to, that I've heard of putting trees or landscaping. Um, so we're talking about light people traffic. And, you know, as much as we do all feel like we know something's going to happen with the property, that people are going to live there. And that's a good thing. That would be a great thing for all of us. Um, it's the number of people that might be there. Five units seems like a lot. Um, and that it's not going to be affordable housing. That one of the numbers kind of talked about was 350000 each. That's not affordable. So, and when I was in the barn and I looked down at my property, I actually could see that my property would be better as a development. I have ample green space. I have enough of a lot that you could make a parking lot and have four units. And I do wonder if once this change is made, what would keep other people from doing that in the neighborhood? At David's house, David Abbott's house, he's got a huge house. It could be four units. He has six acres of land. He's already zoned for two other houses. So I think it would definitely change and could create the beginning of a change for the whole neighborhood. Because we are all dead end streets. You go to the end of town, dead end, Sunset, North College, five houses on each. And I don't even know how many are in town, but it's probably six. How many are in town? On Town Street? Maybe three. It might be six houses. So it's very small. And now we're going to add an apartment building or a condominium building. So it will change the character of the neighborhood, which from what I thought I understood about zoning, that was the purpose of zoning, was to preserve the character. And I, I see shaking your head. So. Well, no, it was, it was, I can go to that if you want, but I don't need to right now. It's it's kind of up to what people want. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I could just comment generally on that. It's like, yeah, there's many purposes of zoning. And, you know, I think in the most recent right of the regulations, there was a lot of talk about infill housing and the increase in density. You know some different different changes going on and so it's all about looking at all the information and weighing um you know what makes sense based on you know specific proposals mm -hmm. um based on the tools we have in the book okay. um but you know just one thing to keep in mind is that you know there's been a, a push in the regulations and the equal regulations to you know increase density based on like you know years ago there was a push to uh you know reduce density and right. give like nice big yards and so right they're 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 Maybe there's a change in the neighborhood. There's there's changes that are happening because there's changes in the regulations and how we see things today versus how we did in nineteen uh, you know nineteen fifty. Um, right. But um, and I understand that piece of it, but it's where we go from three to four to five. Mm -hmm. It's it's the amount of units that you know if it was three, which is sounds like that's guaranteed, but I don't know how we get from three to four to five. And I don't know, I'm not hearing anything that says to me there's a there's any opportunity for it to be less than five now. Now that it's we're talking about five, it seems like five is the number. I haven't I'm not hearing that it's going to be less than five. 
Well, there's a, I mean, there's a process. You've got to see if, the, you know, some analysis about the traffic, which is part of our, you know, um, maybe if we go through, we go through that <laughs> test, uh, you know, but, that, you know, analysis not... about the screen, you know, the screening and, you know, the, we look at the, the proposal and the application as it's been engineered and um, we look at the comments and try to apply them to the regulation. So it's hard for us to say uh, without seeing the whole picture of it. Um, Right. Can and I'm just yeah, trying ahead, to understand Meredith. the process and sure. try to hear what's being said. Can I yep. pipe in for something real quick? Yep. So the five right mm -hmm. now, that is the maximum mm -hmm. under this infill PUD, right? That's what the board came up with, with talking about that calculation about how to get that density bonus. So the maximum, if each of the two two units, number four and number five, can meet to at least three of the density bonus criteria, mm -hmm. then the board has the authority to approve up to five units. Still has to meet the screening requirements. It still has to meet any outdoor lighting requirements. It still has to meet parking requirements, right? It still has to meet all the other standards to get that final approval. Mm -hmm. But five is the maximum. That's That's what the board's discussion here about that was. And that's what Eric needed to know, okay, now how can I invest money to get the more information I need to, to do to be able to put together a final application that has any engineering in it, right? To figure out how to actually fit up to five units in that building, whether it can actually be done and still meet all the building code. He has to be able to get this information right now tonight to move forward so that he knows what's the the highest level he can aim for, which may not be what gets in that application. Mm -hmm. This is a sort of a fact finding mission before he then goes out and gets all the documentation, which is a lot more than was in this application for me to say, yes, that's a complete application. You can go forward to the next step and come back here again, where everybody will get notices and we'll put that notice in the paper again. Okay. So this is step one, and then there's a step two, and then a final decision. Um, right. So at step, if if Eric gets to the point where he feels confident that he has the information, has everything he needs to try and get the board's blessing for an actual permit, mm -hmm. he'll come back for what we call the final application. And that's when any decision, the yay or nay decision on a permit will happen at the board level. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome, Fred. Thank you. Yes. If I may, uh, just that brought up a question about mm -hmm. my comfortability moving forward is that um, the board's interpretation of the number of units that would be allowed with an infill PUD, is that currently at standing at five in this specific case? I'm going to say that as long as you have to meet the criteria, but as long as I meet the criteria, but as far as how, how it's looked at, that's that's not in question at this point. I don't, you know, I don't. That calculation yeah. seems accurate. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, and I'm not seeing any, nobody's, I'm, I'm not getting any red flags yeah. from the two board Great. members and, online. And that shouldn't change. I should have the comfortability that that is not going to change moving forward from this point. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And Auburn, I do know that you're, you have your hand raised. So if you have a time limit or something, you can um, send me that in the um, the chat. If you have a time limit, because you have to get off soon, just send me in that in the chat. Otherwise, I do know you have your hand raised and we'll get to you. Yeah, I don't have a time limit. I'm okay, set. great. Thanks, Auburn. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. Thanks. I'm Rebecca Copans. I live on Cliff Street, so I'm on the other side of the, the up and down side of town. Um, I think there's a lot of similarities between the neighborhood that we're talking about and my neighborhood. Um, I grew up in Montpelier. I've been here since um, we moved here at the big city of Montpelier from Middlesex when I was 10. Um, I have lived here most of my adult life. I left for a few years, went to college, came back. Um, I've lived on Cliff Street since, um, well, Liberty Street and then Cliff Street since um, the early 2000s. So I have a deep familiar, familiar, familiarity and um, a deep love of this town. Um, one thing I know um, is change happens. You know, Main Street used to be dirt. Um, there used to be the park, which I live on, um, was no, there was no trees. Trees come, they go, they grow, they fall down, they're cut. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a worse place to live because, you know, trees come and go. 
Um, I think, so I recently joined the housing committee. I'm not speaking for the housing committee, for sure. I'm speaking for myself, but I recently joined the housing committee because I feel like we have a moral imperative to think positively about our town and dense development is the way, is the only way that we can be responsible about climate change, about um, smart growth, about um, keeping cars, you know, in, in our, in our downtown area, instead of like, you know, I see, I see where my parents live now, you know, there's a lot of people driving a lot and they're building houses in wildlife corridors, which is, um, you know, I've, I've have had conversations with a lot of the people in the room and I know they feel very passionately about, about those, those issues. Um, so I think a lot about growing responsible housing in Montpelier. Um, I think about the character of the neighborhood as, as was discussed. So my, my neighborhood, um, my tiny, you know, tiny neighborhood, it's a dead end. It's very, very similar to this one. Um, we have a traffic problem, you could say, but people drive slowly. Um, we had, you know, the original neighborhood, the original farmhouse in our neighborhood um, was a single family home. So similar to the barn. Um, it is now a five unit building. And there is, um, that change happened and we ha are better off for it. We have wonderful neighbors. We really look out for each other. We care about each other. We are a very much a neighborhood um, in the truest sense of the word. And I, as, I, as I expect this neighborhood as, as well. Um, so the character of the neighborhood, that's really important because growing is part of that character of a neighborhood. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say is, <laughs> This barn's been here as long as my house has been here and houses grow up around it. Um, people move to the neighborhood in the last decade. This barn has been there for a hundred years. Um, and to think, you know, <laughs> to criticize the barn <laughs> for being this big barn um, and not thinking about the potential um, is a real detriment. You know, I think if we can um, responsibly build um, more housing in a footprint that is already existing. That is our greatest opportunity for bringing new neighbors. Um, I, joined, I joined the housing committee because um, for two reasons. One, my daughter is in the seventh grade. Um, one of her very best friends had to leave Montpelier because they could not find housing. Um, they, their house was sold out from underneath them. There was no housing available to them. Um, they were looking for eight months and they eventually the summer just before the seventh grade which is like crushing for a middle school kid they just moved to Portsmouth New Hampshire another um, reason I joined the housing committee is I am um, intensely involved with the new Afghan community that's here we need more housing for them we need more housing for these wonderful new neighbors that we have and I understand people that live here um, in town really have a great privilege to live here and we have a responsibility to ensure that everyone has that same privilege. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, we'll go to, who's got their hand raised? Uh, Auburn. 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 Hey, Auburn. Yes, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm not gonna turn on my video because I keep getting this symbol that says um, my internet might be unstable. So hopefully you can hear me through this whole thing if I keep that off. Um, so I am the house that's abutting 12 North College. I live at 9 North College. My um, my full name is Auburn Watersong. I have lived here for nine years and owned the house for eight. Um, I'm a single mom of two kids who are now in their early 20s in college age. Um, and they were raised here and, and went to Montpelier High School. We moved here um, from uh, an apartment building uh, complex looking because I was looking for basically looking for a yard for my kids that I could afford. Um, I I could afford this house uh, as a rental when I first moved in because I was friends with the folks who rented it to me and then they decided to sell and because I couldn't afford it I went through the downstreet shared equity program and so this is a downstreet shared equity home um, at 9 North College Street. So I am somebody who believes wholeheartedly in affordable housing. I'm sort of a living example of trying to keep housing affordable in Montpelier. So in that way, I do agree with um, the, the previous speaker. I would also say that um, I agree with the idea of, of a 
of a neighborhood and the, and the responsibilities we have to other neighbors. The last two years, well, since, since COVID began uh, in 2020, um, this uh, has been a really difficult place to live. And you probably all have heard some smatterings of what, what has happened at 12 North College in the recent years. So um, with, um, with drugs and, and violence and gun violence, um, domestic violence, um, untreated mental illness, and, and on and on. And um, it amounted to um, a point where my, my, my family and I, we tried to reach out and be neighborly and then realized that we might be risking our own safety. So community safety is a really important piece of this puzzle for me. I know that um, I'm going to be coming back while we go through this process just to keep that on everybody's radar. Um, I want to know that um, the police department will have the capacity to um, to actually help us manage that. Uh, I felt like we were um, definitely because of COVID too, but I felt like we were sort of overwrought um, <laughs> with all that was going on there in the past. And, and that was only, um, I think at the max, there were probably eight adults in there. Um, and I can see that this is going to be, uh, especially if we have 10, 10 parking spaces and five units, we could double the amount of people and more than double the amount of traffic on the, on the street. So there's, there's that safety. The lighting issues that I'm concerned about aren't just from, so you should know that my north side of my building has two windows, two bedrooms, facing the south side of the barn where um, uh, Irik has mentioned that there'll be an entryway, which, which will you know have lighting over the entryway. But then there's also all sorts of weirdly, <laughs> oddly shaped windows there now and when those lights have been left on in the past, it's from the inside, those lights have been left on. It just is, it's a, there's a lot of light pollution. So I would just wanna know, you know, how that will be managed um, or, or how that's gonna be designed and proposed. Um, the inside lighting, not just the outside lighting. Um, and then um, the snow removal, what often happens with snow removal is it gets pushed onto um, my property or pushed onto Fran's property or pushed um, up into that driveway. Now that they won't be able to push it up into the driveway, you know, that um, every every spring we have to like reseed our lawns because of all the salt that gets pushed onto our driveways because there's no place to put it. So snow removal will be, will definitely be an issue. Um, and and again, the the I, I do want to just um, echo Chris um, Chris's concern about the the windows and the landscaping because a lot of landscaping was taken down, so it is very there's a lot more visibility. I have three maples on my property line, um, or right before the property line on my property, um, facing you know between my north side and the and the south side of the barn, and and those are lovely and, and, and fine. They're tall, um, but they don't block all the light. So um, that's, a, that's a question for me. I also feel like five, I, just, I will just agree with everyone. I feel like five is a lot. Um, and especially if we're not doing affordable housing, which I, I really believe in, um, I, uh, I, don't, I don't understand the math about why three you know, doesn't, um, you can't make as as much money with three as you can with five. But um, anyway, I just want to say I I think it's it's five is too much um, for this little street. Um, and at the same time, I want you know I want to make make it known that uh, I understand I I understand totally that things change, things get developed. I'm I support affordable housing and. Um, I know that it's hard to find housing in Montpelier because I had trouble myself as a single mom. So um, I get all those issues, but I just thought um, it would be good for me to sort of express my concerns about how this will change our neighborhood. Um, yeah, thank you so much.
Thank you, Auburn. Uh, Mark LaRosa. Mark? Andres. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, we live at One Town Street, which is the first house you come to when you go up onto Town Street, and we've lived here for about four years now. And uh, I also understand the issue of the housing. It, it took us over a year to find a house, and that was before the pandemic. So um, we're happy that something's happening up at the barn, and we trust that it'll be a much better situation than what's been there in the past. Um, I'd say we agree with some of the concerns that um, Heather and Fran and Auburn have um, mentioned already. Um, for us, the big one would be traffic. And I want to make sure that that gets taken into consideration because we do have a small street and the entrance to our street when you turn off of Maine is a blind hill and a blind curve with no sight line of anybody coming at you from the neighborhood. And right at the crest of that is our driveway. And so, of course, this is our house. It's just we bought it here. We live. But we always take that into consideration because, you know, we walk out, we have to stop fully before we even drive out of our driveway to make sure nobody's coming up the hill. And when we come back to the neighborhood to make a turn into our driveway, we have to turn all the way to the left-hand side of the street just to make the turn into our driveway. And so my point is that the neighborhood isn't really designed for heavy traffic. Um, and I think Chris Killian maybe put it best by uh, sort of discussing that the intensity of use might be where the concern is. So, you know, the character of the neighborhood is a consideration. And I think that's already been addressed for us. It would be mostly the traffic coming in and out of the neighborhood and not just the people who live there, but all the FedEx trucks that go up there, all the UPS trucks, everyone's Amazon prime stuff, you know, and those deliveries do not respect our speed limits as we all know. Um, and then something that Fran mentioned that I also wanted to mention has to do with um, precedent. And I'm just bringing it up because it, it is mentioned in the staff report. It was on page nine. And um, I don't remember, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it does say something about that this will set precedent for future applications. And so I don't know if that means, refers to your process, but I would like to you know, bring up that this, this sets a precedent in the neighborhood for future development. You know, what does this mean if, if three becomes five? What does this mean for every other property owner who might decide to go that route? Suddenly, three becomes five in several properties. Then we're not talking about four extra cars. We're talking about 10 extra cars, et cetera. So I, I, just, I just hope that the, that the review board will take all these in, into consideration. Um, yeah, that's, that, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I have Meg Allison Powden who has her hand up um, on remote. Hey, Meg. You can unmute yourself, Meg. Thank you. Um, I'm another neighbor on North College Street. I live at 7 North, North College, just south of Auburn. Um, I um, concur with Heather and Fran and Auburn about their concerns and Mark. Um, I do agree with Mr. Stauffer that um, I like the fact that the barn is being uh, renovated and there's going to be housing provided um, in an existing structure. Um, I did not quite catch earlier when he referenced affordable housing. I'm not sure if he said why he wasn't looking at affordable housing units. Um, I think, you know, we know Montpelier needs housing, um, but we need housing for people who can afford the housing. Um, so I, I think a mixed housing would be the optimum for the barn. And so I, I just would like the board to address that. I, it sounded like the board's comfortable with five units. And so I would like the board to inform us why there isn't more of a, a request for affordable housing units. I, I, didn't, I didn't catch that earlier. Um, I d agree it's a wonderful neighborhood and I worry about the character of the neighborhood being changed. Um, 
and I'm not against change. I'm just wanting it to be thoughtfully done and being inclusive of all. I think one of the things Montpelier we've experienced, um, we've lived in on North College for 10 years. We moved here primarily for our daughter to have um, an improved educational experience. And um, it was a very mixed experience for her. And one of the reasons I will say that is because we discovered an elitist element within Montpelier. And so that's um, one of the reasons I'm a proponent for mixed housing. And I'd like the board to really um, delve into that more if, if that's your role. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... So yeah, I think a good question about the affordable housing. Uh, I can maybe answer some context here. I think the board probably believes that uh, you know he's got some options of how he can proceed. And at this point in the process, we'd like to you know the board would maybe agree to provide some flex flexibility going forward as to what options to get that bonus he actually chooses. Um, maybe that's something that we you know discuss whether we would require that to be you know decided right now. Um, I don't think we can. Yeah. No. Um, I think that um, I, uh, yeah. that the regulation pretty much states that there are five things. Yep. And then he has to hit three of them. Yep. And it doesn't say which three. Sure. You know, so that we can't say you have to do this piece of it. Yep. I, it, that's my reading of the regulations. Yep. I, I would agree. I, 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 and I could go with that as well. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Huh. Yeah. You know, and in, our, uh, in our role. In our role. Yeah. Right. As. Yeah. as as members of the DRB. Exactly. I mean, yeah. what we feel uh, as individuals is is not yep. really the same. Right. Yeah. It's adherence to, to the zoning regulations. Yeah. yeah. And also say that, that too, yeah, our role is to interpret the regulations, the zoning. There was also a question around the purpose of zoning. You know, then zoning governs the form and the built environment. So, you know, zoning can be exclusionary. You know, there are different things that zoning can do, but um, what big picture, what it does is govern what's built. So where our role is to interpret the regulations here. Yeah, everyone for weighing in on that. Yeah, it looks like from Meg. Yep, Meg. Meg, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I just have a follow-up question then if it's not part of your role. Um, what are the steps to ensure that we have affordable housing options for people who want to move into our community. Who 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 does oversee that, or who does encourage that, or make sure it happens? I think that's an excellent question, and I think we're all trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of different entities. I think if you're talking about the the rules for permits. Um, there are incentives in these regulations, just just like here to get that density bonus, right? To be able to put in more units. One of the options is to make sure that those extra units, those two extra units meet this, this affordability if that's what somebody chooses. Um, so there's, there's a role for the zoning regulations to change the zoning regulations. It's a process through the planning commission and city council. Um, and city council has other opportunities to do that. Um, there's, if you, you know, reach out to our planning department and particularly our economic development specialist, um, he and our planning director, Mike Miller, are sort of the, the planning department people who help make suggestions for potential policy changes um, or grant programs, things like that. So um, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. Just to, I think that, you know, what we, what we have to sort of work with is the regulations here. If you wanted to see the regulations be different or to be more enforcing of affordable housing, you would need to go to the planning commission to change the regulations so that we could do something different here. Yeah. That being said, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of stakeholders in affordable housing here. Yeah. Um, there's a newly formed housing task force. There's, there's homelessness task force. There's, there's a bunch of people who are very interested in it. Um, so that, uh, and I think all of those people come to city council and, um, you know, just are. Everybody knows that the affordable housing crisis is pretty is pretty dire around here. 
I think we can all agree with you there. No question. Uh, and I'll add too, and I think an, the existence of an infill PUD is a tool, you know, which can be intended to increase affordability by increasing housing supply and also decreasing reliance on cars. You live it, having a you know higher number of units in closer proximity to downtown, but it's like one tool out of the many tools that can be used. So, and then, and fi you know, finance is a yeah, key thing that we're not even talking about here. Yeah. And yeah, in terms of the complexity of affordable housing development too with uh, tax credits. And that's a, yeah, it's a whole, it's a different story. So I'm just Oh yeah. Yeah, to further what Catherine just said, um, affordable housing is, you know, housing is still a capitalist venture in this country. And that's obviously not changing anytime soon. And right now Montpelier is just, experiencing extreme amount of demand people want to live here and supply is limited um so if you're talking about adding housing that in theory um the more housing you add the more affordable the rest of it gets as you increase supply now, i don't know if we'll ever reach that point where supply and demand become equal because it's you know difficult to develop in this town and there's only so much space and um but that needs to be kept in mind that if you don't build any new houses, the you know the remaining houses just continue to go up in value. Um, as you increase supply, that's when demand and prices start to come down. So, just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else in the room uh, here to speak? I'm Sam Tormey. I live at uh, Five Sunset Avenue. Uh, my wife Tori and I bought it uh, two years ago, moved into the neighborhood, and um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate here that we do really enjoy our neighborhood. Neighborhood, and uh, we heard a lot from a lot of neighbors uh, tonight, and a lot of really good and important concerns and things for the board to consider as they um, assess the proposal from Eric. Um, but yeah, just getting back to, I mean, it is a neighborhood that's close to town that would expand housing that's close to town. There's been a lot of discussion about traffic and cars but it is close to town e-bikes are getting a bit more popular it's tough to get up that hill on a regular bike but um you know there's the character of the neighborhood ha out as it has been and then there's the potential you know character and future for the city and i think that with all of the concerns and um you know our situation we live farther away from that traffic so it's not as big a issue as it is for some of our neighbors i fully understand that but i also would um just like to say that we appreciate the openness that eric has shown to the neighborhood to have that meeting with jack set up and uh you know we have seen the barn every day and uh since we moved in and you know a thoughtful and considerate proposal for what it could be is um something i think we should consider and if it's if three units is not financially viable i think we'd be staring down um another potentially less um amenable solution for that area so i think we just want to you know stay involved with this process and um hope that it can work out well for everyone involved thank you else on the uh zoom platform weigh in I don't see anybody there. It looks like Chris has another Chris? comment. Can, can I just ask? Oh, you got to got to go to the mic so that we can get it on the minutes. I just wanted to. This is Chris Killian again. I just wanted to clarify um, that I'm well. Clarify that I'm confused about the front of the building and what is the front yard, um, because I've heard the front referred to as where the cars are. Mm -hmm. And that that's the front entrance to the building. And then I just heard tonight that the front yard is is this what I would call the side yard, uh, which is along the eave side of the roof. Yeah. So let and me I'm just let me I share just, the screen yeah. so that everybody can see. So the front yard for purposes of determining where cars are allowed to be parked. And for um, the setbacks, right? How how far from property boundaries um, new buildings or structures need to be is between the street, which here is down here, right? Here's the street right of way is actually down. It, it here's the road that's driven on, but the street right of way actually extends over here. 
is between the front line of the building and the street. And the front line of the building for this purpose is the part that's closest to the street. Right. No matter which, no matter where your front door is, where you enter the building, for purposes of zoning, it's going to be the side that faces the street. That's true. So, solely because of that weird little jag. There's the no way. other. There's no other streets here. Otherwise, okay. we have absolutely so, no front. We have to pick a front, whichever whichever side of a parcel is attached to a street is the front yard for these purposes of deciding where you park cars, or how setback. you measure where your structures need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's a corner parcel, you actually have two fronts, right? If you have two streets, if your parcel is bordered by two streets, you have two fronts. Here, there's one front for that purpose. Now, the main entrance is gonna be on this side facing the driveway and the, the parking area, right? So that's gonna come into play when we talk about pedestrian access to the building. Um, because this is a funky parcel and the way it's surrounded by other parcels and everything, I'm going to sort of go out on a limb and say that when Eric and I are looking at the pre put together plan, because I do some review of those things before they make it to the board, depending on how he arranges his parking, it might be a situation where I suggest he ask for maybe a waiver of a variance on some of those parking spaces if we're talking about it competing with a need for screening from neighbors, things like that. All those things come into play when we get to the next stage, right? It gets more complicated because you start looking at everything else that comes into play. And at that point, there's a weighing of needs and the particular situation of a particular parcel. But in general, the requirement under these regulations is that all the parking be pushed behind the front line of the building as determined by what's considered basically the front property line. Does that help? Uh, sort of. <laughs> you, we can set up a meeting and you can come into the office too. Yeah. If we want to talk about how this all meshes together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, when I was looking at the regulations or earlier this week in between other meetings. Um, there's also a reference to PUDs being considered through the same process as subdivision. For process, for not, process. not for substantive standards, but for process. There's a procedural chapter yep. further back right. that talks about having to go through sketch plan and final review. Right. That's the, that's the, the same process. As a subdivision. As a subdivision. <laughs> Okay. It doesn't mean that chapter 350 for subdivisions okay. comes into play. Right. Okay. okay. I see yeah. no hands online. Questions from board members, comments? Do you feel like you have sufficient guidance to come up with something? I do. I think. <laughs> Knowing that um, five units is um, what is uh, approved, or that's how the board, in, approved is the wrong word, I understand, uh, how that the board is, the is interpreting word. the regulations, the five units, that is very comforting um, to know and allows me really to move forward. That's the, so the, I, just, I just was going to throw one caveat out there, and I'm not completely yeah. concerned, and we've never, uh, you know, addressed this, but, you know, provided that you have the amount of square footage that we calculated, you know, the survey were to be done. And that would be different and you know no, I'm, just, but, I, I'm just i mean i'm just saying this because it's like you know it's like we are deciding like what criteria is used in order to get the square footage for the calculation for you know for for density in a process that we've never you know gone you know gone through now i think we could make a educated judgment that the buffer here is fine and that you know you've got 5.22 dwelling units if it was 5.01 it may be different but I just wanted okay. to bring it up there, here because okay, there is a survey. This is an image of a subset of it. I know what I know. I know your background. Hmm. The well, PUD requirement doesn't. I, I get what you're saying. Where you say if it was right, if we're talking a few feet difference, you'd want to see an updated survey. Is what you're saying? I'm saying is that in the final application, it can provide the survey and say like this is where I got my acreage as an exhibit. You know, I think that that's. A part of the application where you know okay. they make the argument of the information they had, but 
we can just, you know, we're being asked about a specific, you know, acreage and number of units based on a square footage. And I'm just throwing out there that it's like, not like we're determining today that yes, that is based on the information provided. It is. And You're determining how it's calculated. You're yes. confirming how it's calculated, yes. not what the ultimate calculation is. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Got that, Eric? Understood. <laughs> so if I have a stamped survey, which I do, right? Am I correct? Then the process of um, questioning that survey, which is what we're talking about right now, would be what? I mean, I, I'm not saying that I'm going to question, yeah. you know, question that survey. I'm just, I'm just throwing out that you know where the information is coming up and what its meaning is, and you know, discussion for the board. It's like we have some sort of a bit, you know, responsibility to say that you know when we approve the application, we're saying that like our zoning regulations say that we need a certain amount of square footage. What information do we feel is sufficient in order to say that we have that amount of square footage? Right. And I'm not saying that there's a right or a wrong way to do it. I'm just mm -hmm. bringing that up for, for conversation. But I was interpreting that we did have that right information tonight. Did we not? We have we have a snippet of a survey that doesn't have a date on it. We don't know who did it. If you don't if you don't know Rob's background, Rob works as a survey. I understand that. So okay, I'm just yeah. I think that it's it's important. I'm re having bring this conversation because this is the first time we're doing that. You know, we're going through this process, yeah. and if we just go through and say you never need a survey for a PUD, you can just use what the yes. tax map says. Then uh, we have a problem for the next you know ten years yeah. when someone tries to do five point zero one dwelling units. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, yeah. you're setting a standard for what's required for the application in the future that there needs to be a survey so that we can confirm the square footage since the board is giving this yes. density bonus. Yes. So that also sets a standard for a zoning administrator as to what includes com complies with a complete application. So that's yes. Okay. Yeah. And just to be clear, in this case, I'm not being argumentative, but there actually is a survey that is on file with the city that is sure. named and on file. So it is not a snippet of something that's not yeah. unnamed. So yeah. there is actually is a document in this case. Absolutely. But that's just yeah. want to make that clear. Right. And there's not a document here. It's elsewhere. What's that? It's, it's a piece of the of yeah, the, the one that's in here is a right. piece of it's it. It's a snapshot so, of the, the one being held that is held on file. On the file. Yeah. Right. Oh, we did get a late attendee yeah. to say when we get back to Becca Hone. Becca, did you have anything to add to the conversation? Hi, Becca. Do you, yeah, there you go. Not at the moment. Thank you. Okay, we're we're kind of at the tail end. So if you had comments or concerns about the application, you'll want to be able to say them fairly soon. I think we're getting near the end. Yeah. I, I just for for me the the thing that I wanted to make sure that you understood is that um just what you'll need to, to get that don't bonus density that it will we'll need to absolutely need three of those standards Absolutely. completely. That is very clear to me. And then we'll need documentation and all that. Understood. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think working with Meredith to come up with, you know, we've never gone through the energy efficiency portion of that. I think if there's some statewide standards that probably be helpful, you know, guidance um, on that. Uh, but also know, the accessibility that. part, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not up to speed on that, you know, yeah. as, much, as much as it should be in terms of what is visitable or accessible and yeah. what that's going to mean. Yeah. I think there's, there's state there's state definitions for those in state statute okay. um and so we would be working to parse all those out and okay. um there's also you know we've already had some conversations uh, reflected just a little bit in this packet with the department of public works about how do you get accessible parking spaces things like that okay that was my concern yeah that's all that i have one last call going once twice and then Becca, double check. Becca, did you have any concerns you wanted to raise? Just making sure before we close this out, the, the meeting itself, there'll be a recording available on um, the city website so that you can hear everything that was said. Um, okay. That should be on the city website tomorrow. You can also just email me, Meredith Crandall, um, with the city, the zoning administrator, and I can send you a link to that when it's um, on the Orca Media's YouTube site too. They usually get it up first and then we have to trim it a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's it. Okay. Just have, uh... So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for coming, sharing. Thank you, everybody, for attending online as well.
Um, so our next meeting will be uh, November 21st. And we do have applications. Or, uh, or no. Well, this is, we weren't we wanted to make sure in case we got completely overwhelmed with people and needed to yep. continue the sketch plan. So we actually do not have any applications for November 21st. Okay. It's Thanksgiving. So, okay. so, uh, okay. yep. so you all get that off. And our next meeting will be Monday, December 5th. Oh. December? Uh, yeah. Oh. How did that happen? Hey, hey, we're already working out the schedule for next. By Kevin, second by Sharon. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Michael.